shall we bow our heads? Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you for being with us and promising to give us, send your Holy Spirit to direct our minds. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our chapter today is chapter one of the book Power of Humility. And the first chapter echoes the title of the book, The Empowering Principle of Humility. And uh, Jesus, when he was here, after his resurrection, he was talking to the disciples and he says, uh, you will have power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. But he told them, you wait here in Jerusalem. You wait until the Holy Spirit has come. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no power. Now, our title to our uh, chapter and the book indicates that that power was received by us only in humility. I may have mentioned this last time, but it's worth repeating. The most important uh, requirement for spiritual ministry, whether you're a pastor or whether you're a medical doctor or something else, the most important ingredient required for power in ministry is humility. There is none greater. It is humility that causes a person to depend on the Holy Spirit. And the power comes through the Holy Spirit. When I was a young man in college, I often wondered, someday I may be able to tell you the whole story, which is a very interesting story. But I wondered, I knew I could convince people, or at least I knew I could present clear arguments for the faith. We have a powerful message. And it is tremendously cohesive. I did not have any question, but what I could present to people the principles of Scripture. What I begin to con be concerned about, however, is could I really bring them to Christ? Could, could my ministry result in true conversions? That's not something we are able to do. And I don't care how effective or how eloquent the presentation of a subject may be. It may be on conversion or whatever. But if the individuals listening are converted, it is not the fault of the speaker. It's a result of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, how can we be assured of having the ministry of the Holy Spirit when we are the ones conveying these uh, through speaking, preaching, or whatever? How can we be assured of that? And I would like to say right up front at the beginning that this is why I wrote the book, The Power of Humility. It is only as we humble ourselves before God and receive the Holy Spirit that he is able to function in and through us. We have <clears throat> asked for his presence. We've claimed it and God has made a promise. So that promise is that God will meet with us and that he will guide our minds through the Holy Spirit. Now, how can we be sure by humbling ourselves before God. He has made the promise, but that promise depends upon our response. And our response must be a response of humbling ourselves before God. Now, <clears throat> we'll have occasion to speak of these things later, but right on the beginning, I'd like to say that um, our humility, that is humbling ourselves before God, is measured not by our profession, not by how many hours we spend studying the Bible, 
not by uh, any of these things. It is measured by how we treat those who may oppose us. Not just how we treat our friends. We generally treat their friends pretty well. They treat us nicely. And so we are responsive to them. But how we humble ourselves before God has to do with how we relate. If we relate in humility to those who may uh, castigate us or oppose us or be opposed to our views. So humility is the most important factor in Christian experience. And it is certainly the most important requirement for effective witness. Now, <clears throat> Jesus said, you will have power. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about power because in this world, everyone is power hungry. People seek money to have power. People seek position because that will give them power. They seek prestige because that gives power. It gives them the ability to control. Now, if that is our desire for power, then uh, we'll be disappointed if we're depending on the Holy Spirit because he does not honor those uh, motives. The desire for power should be singular, and that is for witness. Mm. And of course, power to overcome, and that's a part of the witness. Our, our, day, our, our lifestyle and so forth is our witness. So the most important thing is humility. And the measure of my humility before God is measurable by my attitude toward others, in particular those who don't like me too well, <laughs> or those who made literal and, and directly oppose me. How do I relate to them? Now, <clears throat> um, this is the answer to this question determines how we humble ourselves before God. When Jesus comes, according to Matthew 20, uh, five, uh, 25, uh, he will have two people, two groups of people before him, those on the right, those on the left. To those on the right, he will say, come, you blessed my father. And then he will tell us all the things that we've done for him. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was naked, you club covered me. I was in prison, you came to me. A lot of different things and the saints will say, Lord, and I'm using my own words now to make it a little more meaningful, you must have the wrong person in mind. I don't remember seeing you. When were you hungry and I fed you? When were you in prison and I went to see you? And his answer, inasmuch as you've done it, and to one of the least of these, you've done it to me. And of course, you remember that those on the left, the reverse that, uh, took place, or is to take place. And they'll wonder, when did we not visit you in prison? When did we leave you hungry and thirsty? Well, he said, because you have left my children in thirst naked, whatever it is, without doing something for them. Now, <clears throat> this is the test. As a matter of fact, it just dawned on me, I think that was a part of the last night's sermon, wasn't it? Uh, the, uh, the pastor brought something out about those who, yes, it was Matthew 25 that he specialized on. At any rate, this subject that we're dealing with, SDA history is really going to be about humility. Uh, it will be about many other things, of course, but the key we're going to find is humility. Why are we still here? It's very simple, pride. Because of pride, we 
do not depend as we should. I will not depend upon Christ for anything that I don't sense a need for. <laughs> if I think I have sufficient humility, for instance, I'm not going to be begging him for more humility. I would like to invite you to join me every morning in my prayer, one of the first things I do, and this is a routine thing, and don't be afraid of doing, being routine on many things, but I ask him for humility, the gift of humility. It's not something I can produce. It is, it, I am dependent upon him for it. So are you. And I think this is a good prayer to close the day with as well and perhaps invite through the day, and especially if there are people who oppose you in some way or are not courteous to you, ask God to give you love for them. And God, ask God to help them. By the way, every wrong deed is a cry for what? Anyone know how to finish that quote? Every wrong deed is a cry for help, H-E-L-P. When somebody's rude to you, what are they asking for? They're asking for help. They're saying, I need help because I wouldn't be rude to you if everything was all right within me. So I need help. How do we help them? Well, first of all, by being courteous. And then by asking God to help us to know how and what way can we help them. But most important, courteous. If people are discourteous, then you help them by being courteous. Help them to be able to become courteous. So the humility then is the key to witness. But I want to put the negative statement again, power without humility produces weakness. Power through humility gives strength. Power without humility uh, actually weakens a person. And seeking power disqualifies a person for power. Now some of you are going to be on nominating committees someday have I perhaps have already, but you will find that occasionally a head elder wants to senses that that he's been there now several years and he expects that's going to be his uh, right to be first elder next time. But it may not be. It may be better to do, even if he's doing a, a good job, that doesn't mean he should always be there. There are others who need the training and it may be deaconship or maybe superintendent, it could be anything, but there will be individuals in your congregations that will feel the need to retain the power of their office. That is a seeking of power, whether you realize it or not. Anyone who seeks an office does not deserve it. Because humility is the basic requirement for any office within the church and those who seek it. Now, I'm not saying if a person is eager for an office, they might may not be seeking it, but, but are eager to share their talent and, and they're willing to do so. But if there is evidence of them seeking the office, that's a good way, a good uh, signal that they, somebody else should be appointed. I happen to have had the experience on more than one occasion of having people within my church who felt they owned an office. And if anyone gets a feeling that they have been put in too many times, there needs to be changes. Those changes for one reason is to help people not to get the feeling of ownership because those offices are there for servants of God those who are there to minister to others. And when a person begins to sense the office, it belongs to him, this is power. This is a, a feeding on power. 
they have the sense of that. Now, the problem then is not with power. Power is not always good, not always bad. But power itself is not the problem. But when the problem ha has to do with the purpose of the power, with the source of the power, and with its use. And uh, the humble person is happy for his brother or sister to have an office and for them to support them. But if they are humble, God may choose to place them in that position. James and John were disciples of Jesus. They had, along with the other ten, been with him for, most of them had been with him for about three years or a little longer. And he had been teaching them daily by precept and by example. But pride is a very difficult thing to deal with. Pride is so deep that it's almost impossible to see it in oneself. We can see it in others, especially if they cross our paths. But uh, to see it in ourselves is very difficult. And we need to plead with God. When we plead with humility, for humility, we need to plead with him that we uh, recognize our pride because you cannot receive the gift of humility if you don't sense your pride. You won't be reaching out for it. This should be something you covet every day that God will grant to you the gift of humility. I was telling you a story, wasn't I? Can you help me back? Did I finish? I, I started sermonizing a bit. <laughs> what was it? Oh, James and John, thank you, thank you. Yes, I knew I had something. I hadn't finished, but I put in a parenthesis. <laughs> thank you. Uh, James and John had been with Christ for several years. He had taught them carefully. Christ is the greatest teacher this world has ever known, and he had a perfect example that they could see in his life, which helps the learner a great deal when the teacher is practicing his own principles. And yet, when it came down to almost the time for Christ to be crucified, here they come with their mother to Jesus. Now, this seems a bit strange for two grown men to depend upon their mother, but this was the degree of pride. They thought, well, he'll listen to her. And so here they come, the three of them, and, and they ask the question, uh, can we ask you a question, Jesus? Please say yes. <laughs> well, Christ asks, what was the question? Well, the mother says, I have two boys, and they're really good boys, and they've been following you carefully, and and uh, whatever she said specifically, we don't know, but she represented them as worthy of the highest positions in the kingdom she was sure she, he was about to set up. And here they were, and there she was, and Christ said, it is not for me to give these positions, it's for my Father in heaven. But what do you think was the key condition for that position? We can tell when we look at Christ's discussion of John the Baptist. After John's disciples had been there asking, are you the one who's to come or should we look for another? And he had them stay by till they had all day long to see his miracles. And then instead of answering them, he said, uh, you go tell John what you've seen mm -hmm. and, and remind him that I hope he's not uh, disappointed in me. <laughs> what did he say after they left? 
what he said was very interesting. He started by asking them questions. Who did you go out to the Jordan to see? He was talking about John. Did you go out there to see a man dressed in, in uh, king's clothes? Uh, did you go out there to see uh, several questions? And he made it his point. Of those who have been born of women, no one is greater than John. Now, Jesus had been announced by John, and yet when it came time for John to be, uh, to be slain, he did nothing to defend him. He did not go to, to get him released. He could have done that in various ways. Undoubtedly, many of the disciples were wondering, why? Why is he, doesn't he defend his friends? And then he said, of those born of women, no one, and he, by the way, spoke of a prophet, no one is greater than John. And yet, he said, anyone who is more, and these are my words, but that's what he meant, more humble than John is greater than he. How can we be the greatest? By being the most committed servants and by receiving most freely of the gift of humility. We are selfish people. For God to transform our lives in such a way as to use us in the final climax of his movement is going to be a first class miracle. Just as great as the miracle of bringing Lazarus back to life. In fact, a greater miracle. Because that's physical life. He could easily do that. But when it comes to transforming the minds, we have a part to play. And if we don't play our part, we prevent him from doing what he wants to do and eager to do and ready to do. And fully capable of doing. But if we do not humble ourselves, it limits what he can do with us. And even as I share these principles with you and challenge you in this way, I want to tell you that every day I ask that God will not only give me the gift of humility, which in receiving we don't feel it. Others may see it, but we're not thinking, oh, I'm becoming more humble. Because that means we're thinking of ourselves and we're probably deceiving ourselves. But there is a very important thing and that is for us to pray every day that the Lord will reveal our selfishness because that's how he helps us become humble by placing in us a great sense of need and when he does answer that prayer be careful don't run away from him thank him for it praise him for it and ask him for the gift of humility uh, and for the gift of love you see, love and humility are two sides of the same coin. If we truly receive the love of Christ, we will be humble. If we are truly humble, it is only because we do receive his love, which is the only thing that can combat selfishness. Selfishness and love are the opposite things. Now, I wanted to call your attention to what else Jesus had to say about that same time uh, on the evening of his uh, betrayal. He said, a new commandment. Oh, and by the way, I should mention that this was just after the fe uh, feet washing service. You remember Jesus? The disciples all felt too proud to humble themselves and wash the feet of the rest of the disciples and Jesus. So Jesus did it, and then he told them afterward, a new commandment I'm going to give to you. And he said that you love 
one another as I have loved you. This was in the Sabbath school lesson just a week or two ago. How did Jesus love them? Did they know, did uh, people in the Old Testament, by the way, were given these same commandments, so, so how can they be new? Jesus says, a new commandment I've given to you. Well, he was quoting from the Old Testament where he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and so forth, and love your neighbor as yourself. But now he is saying something a little different. He says, love your neighbor as I have what? Loved you. Now that's a higher standard. For me to love my neighbor as myself is not the same as to love my neighbor as he loves me. But this is God's requirement. And his last prayer with the disciples, John 17, closes with three different times begging God to make them one. As he was with the Father one, and that they would be one with each other. And brothers and sisters, when we are one with each other, we is because we're one with him. Otherwise, selfishness will prevail and we'll have feelings of superiority. We may not know it, but it's there. Now, Peter talked about the priesthood. There are people within the Adventist church today who feel that uh, we are not priests. That was the Old Testament and that that in the Old Testament there were priests, now we have ministers. But it happened to be that one of the key leaders of the early church, Peter, explained that we were a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. He has quite a bit to say about the priesthood of the Christian church. And by the way, the reason why people are opposed to the idea of priesthood is they attach it, at, apply it to the um, Roman Catholic Church. But when we speak, priest, uh, we speak of priesthood of believers, we are repudiating the Roman Catholic Church, not echoing it. You see, in the Catholic Church, it's a priesthood of the kleros and the laos people. Kleros, meaning the um, officers. So there, it is the kleros who operate the Roman Catholic Church. The laity have nothing to say, but yes, or, you know, to do what they tell them to do. But this is, God's plan is a priesthood of laos, that's people. The priesthood of believers are people. And so we have within the Roman Catholic Church, we have a priesthood that is in direct conflict with the priesthood of believers. So priesthood of believers is the divine solution to the papal priesthood. Now I just wanted to call your attention to uh, how easy it is for us to lose the priesthood of believers and how challenging it is to follow the priesthood of believers. In Revelation, the second chapter, we have the beginning of seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, etc. In the very first one is Ephesus and everything looks good about Ephesus till we come down toward the end. But he says, I have something against you. Well, what was it he had against them? What evil thing were they doing? Well, very simple. Well, you've left your first love. I mentioned love and humility are the flip sides of the same coin. And when you begin to lose your first love, brothers and sisters, it's very serious because it is because pride is taking the place of humility. Pride is the direct opposite of humility, as love and selfishness are direct opposites. 
And when you have love, you have humility. And you have unselfishness. So these are, are the flip sides of the coin. Now what happened was that every church from then on, for the most part, and we'll show the exception, um, became more and more, have lost what God had given them more and more. And in 2 Thessalonians 2, the latter part of this same Ephesus period, which we, uh, it's a, the period of the apostles, which dates down to about 100 when John was uh, finally uh, died. But uh, he told the Thessalonians the mystery of iniquity. Who is the mystery of iniquity? Well, in the Bible, it's called by different names. The little horn of Daniel 7 and 8. Uh, actually, it was uh, the uh, ultimate of pride. This is uh, the mystery of iniquity. An organization which the whole organization throughout uh, defied the pr principle of humility. And that system was the papacy. And this morning, very briefly, I'm going to take you through the churches to show how, step by step, the uh, churches came under the control of Satan himself. So in Ephesus, you've left your first love. And Thessalonians, during the same period, he says, the mystery of iniquity does already work. When we lose our first love, it's because the mystery of iniquity is beginning his work in our lives. And uh, self-exaltation is the key to the mystery of iniquity. It's the key to Satan's earth. So the self-exaltation uh, destroys true priesthood of believers, which is based on humility, one toward another. So we establish as a church our humility by God, to, to, to God by our humble relationships to each other and by how we relate to religious issues. Things that we maybe, let's say women's, liber uh, you know, women's ordination, or whatever you might say. If we are not under the direction of the Holy Spirit, God cannot lead us. And if we are not receiving the gift of humility, we will not be able to be humble. Mm -hmm. Humility is a gift. We must understand it. And we must recognize that it's a gift we have to ask for continually. Because it's a gift that is continually threatened by self our own uh, natural carnal disposition is at war with, with uh, humility because we are by nature seeking to exalt self. Now the result, which we will see a little more, uh, was the papacy by indulging in self-exaltation, destroying the principle of humility, resulted in the papacy. Now, the third principle of the Reformation of the 16th century, you remember Martin Luther and others, what were their th three principles? Do you know? Can anyone say them? Sola Scriptura. Pardon? Sola Scriptura, number one. I heard. That's what I said. Okay. What's number two? Sola fide, a sola gracia, sola fide. Actually, it's a, you have to say them both because we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. And by the way, sometime I may have a chance to discuss with you that this is the solution to those who are concerned about are we saved by grace or grace and faith. The position of the Reformation was sola fide, gratia, sola fide. Now those, that's the order they need to be in. 
God's grace alone coming to me, my receiving it by faith alone. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the, it's the grace of God that saves me. It's my faith that receives salvation. And when it does, he puts me to work. <laughs> and uh, without works, there is no salvation. But we're not saved by works. We're saved by his grace, which we receive by faith. And that's why we have to plead with him for humility. Because as we receive that humility and reveal it in our works, we are revealing the character of God. And we're receiving his grace. So, of these three, what do you suppose is the most important? Sola Scriptura, Sola Gracia, Sola Fide, which is one, uh, number two, by the way, but both to be, or priesthood of believers. Which one is the most important? Sola Gracia? Sola. Pardon? Sola gra Gracia? No, it's the priesthood of believers. Because you see, and I'm talking about from the practical standpoint. So what happens is that the priesthood of believers, and I'm going to put P-O-B, priesthood of believers, requires that every Christian be dependent upon Scripture. The nature of priesthood of believers has a specific configuration, and that is dependence upon the Holy Spirit and humbling the believers, humbling themselves to ask God to lead them. This is what really amounts to. The priesthood of believers, we receive God's message through his word, but how do we know how to interpret it? Only the Holy Spirit can interpret it properly. And only when we are in unity can he interpret it to us. When we're in, uh, fighting each other, the Holy Spirit is unable to do what he wants to do in guiding our minds. So can you see why humility is the, the, the basic thing? We talk about love quite a bit. More and more I speak of humility. I'm talking about the same thing, of course, because humility and love are, one cannot exist without the other. But we can assume that we love without being humble. And uh, so it, it is a, a very important thing that we understand clearly the nature of salvation. And the just shall live by faith, yes. But again, if the priesthood of believers is not functioning properly, and we'll find out that it hasn't always been, and we'll see the results. If the priesthood of believers is not functioning properly, it interferes with the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit to guide the individuals and the church. And because we have not yet understood the priesthood of believers, you'll hear me refer to this many times. And if you share this with somebody else, they may say, what do you mean by priesthood of believers? Or, or they may even oppose it, thinking that this is some kind of a subtle uh, deception leading us back to the, the papacy. No, no, the papacy took us away from priesthood of believers. Remember that. Priesthood of believers were the principles that were established by Christ through his disciples right from the very beginning. And that's why when there were questions to be raised about, like for instance, uh, in uh, uh, Antioch, when the believers had this conflict, they sent representatives to Jerusalem to meet with a body of people that came from all over the world. This organization that we have today is not, that is in other words, it, it is as much as humanly possible modeled after the 
way in which the early church was. God leads us as individuals, but he is especially anxious to lead us as a body. And that's why he says where even two or three are gathered together. There is, it's God's urgent plan that would be united, that we come together, that we have a sense of unity. And, and uh, one of the most important things is that there are times when there are issues that come to us, um, theological issues maybe, and we feel very strongly about it. It was hard to feel loving towards somebody you think is violating the important, you know, most important principles. Yes, it is hard, and in fact, I would say it's impossible. But God commands for it, commands it. He calls for it. His biddings are his enablings. So though it is humanly impossible because it's pretty hard to stand there when somebody is, is a, you know, uh, opposing you in very strong ways, not to defend yourself. But Christ is our defense. Mm -hmm. And we can uh, channel our enemies, our, our energies, <laughs> channel our enemies into praying for the one who is in error rather than fighting him. That's what he really needs. Every wrong deed is a cry for help. Every wrong theological conclusion cries out for help. So what we need to do is learn how to call upon God for a consistent, humble spirit and pray that he will help us to be kind and loving and thoughtful to even our enemies. And if we are to win them, we can only win them through love. We cannot win them by proving to them they're wrong. Well, what happened in the Protestant Reformation? These three principles were their governing principles of the Reformation and resulted in breaking the back of the papacy. It, and I want to explain how, why it is that the third is the most important. Without the priesthood of believers, there is no sola scriptura. The priests will, will rule or some body of theologians will rule. Do you, want to, do you understand what I'm saying? God says, no, you are a central part of my organization, and you, along with you and you and the rest, are responsible not only to pray for the confession of your own sin, rather than a priest do it, not only to be responsible for your understanding of truth, but you are responsible to submit yourself to your brothers and to be, as you are responsible collectively, you are going to be united. Otherwise, there's no unity. And this is what God is calling for. I didn't mention, I had on the screen John 17. Yes, I did mention his prayer, didn't I? that they may be one. Well, brothers and sisters, his great burden for his church is there in John 17, where he says, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. And where he pleads with them, with his father repeatedly for the unity of his church as you and I are related. Now, there is no schism between Christ and Father. They are an absolute unity. God intends for us to pray for that unity. We have uh, WYC, is it? You, uh, no, GYC coming up. I have the privilege of being one of the uh, participants in that. And uh, I'm grateful for that privilege. This will be the first opportunity I've had. But uh, nothing will happen there that will be effective unless we humble ourselves before God. And that means for me as well as, in other words, I'm not speaking, saying we and meaning you. It's us, all of us. And uh, if we do humble ourselves before God, he will answer us. 
and it may not be, the results may not be precisely what we have in mind. We couldn't possibly have in mind what he has in mind. And his, what he has in mind is better than anything we could think of. But this is a great opportunity. I want you to begin praying to be, you know, right now for GYC. As you pray for yourself, pray for the church. Um, I think by the time we finish this, we'll recognize that the church is vastly more important than most people realize. And God will finish his work and he will do it through the church. Now, if he does it through you, you'll be a part of the church. And if you remain faithful and he does it through the church, he will be doing it through you as a part of the church. Now, there's the you's all over. But the important thing is for us to understand that God will not be able to finish his work until he has a church that reveals his character. I uh, have only gone a few slides and I don't want to get caught like I did last time. So I have about 20 minutes to speed up a little bit. The message to restore the priesthood of believers. God gave us a special message to do that. He brought, gave us a special message, the very purpose of which was to, to uh, um, humble in the dust the glory of man. We'll be dealing with that later on. But that message was given in 1888 at Minneapolis. It was rejected. We're still here. What is the essence of that message? It's very simple. There are many people that spend their lives preaching the Minneapolis message and never ever express what it really is. The Minneapolis message is so simple that even a child can understand it. It's not a, a major theological hurdle that has to be, you know. What is the Minneapolis message in just a few words. The Minneapolis message is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now we can say that in many ways and we can explain it in many ways. But it is the message that Christ's righteousness is the only righteousness that will take us through the judgment. And when we claim Christ's righteousness, we then and only then are free to truly grasp our own corruption. Because otherwise we're sealing our uh, a death sentence. Do you know what I'm saying? If I'm really that selfish, what hope is there for me? Well, certainly there is no help in it. There is no hope for me in myself. There is nothing I can do to save myself. That's why Paul was so urgent. By faith, you are saved by grace. I'm sorry. You are saved through faith. It's God's grace meeting our corruption that reverses the very portrait that has God has of because he places Christ's righteousness under my name. My corruption has already been taken by him. It's a very simple thing, and that is that the message of, of Minneapolis is to lift him higher, Christ. Higher, higher. That we focus upon Christ, not ourselves. And this is why uh, I have written the book. Um, and by the way, if you don't have a copy, I'd be glad to give you one. In fact, I hope I can remember Brother Gary to give one to all the students. Uh, the name of that book is uh, The Ad Adventist Cultures in Conflict. Now, we have two basic cultures within Adventism. And one culture says you have to become perfect in order to be saved. And the other says that is wrong any, F, any focus on perfection is evil because it results in intensifying self 
righteousness. Well, I think both sides have a very important message to give, but neither is listening to the other. When we get the core message of both and put them together, then we have the solution. We are that corrupt. We can't do anything about it. Those who emphasize the fact that it's impossible to be perfect are right. You could be here a millennium, do all your best, and you would still never make it. Sin is curable, but it's not curable by human beings. Perfection is required. But his commands are his promises. Whatever he commands us to do, it is faith in him that permits this to be done. It is not by our seeking one at a time to get rid of this and get rid of that and so forth. Supposing now you were to become perfect. You didn't do any bad thing. You had given up all bad habits. Would you be saved? Not without Christ's righteousness. You would have no basis for appeal and the judgment. Even if you could be as perfect as we have often been urging our people to become, we're not saved by perfection. Oh, yes, we are, by his perfection, not ours. And we first have to come to the place where we know we can't be saved before we can have confidence that he will save us. Because in the first instance, we're trying to do what we can never do. It's impossible. But when we recognize the impossibility and claim his righteousness, which is already a fact. We already are in the position, if anything happened to us that we died, like Karen did the other day, just suddenly, we, I have no question. Karen was prepared by God. And let me say this. She thought she was preparing for marriage. But God was using that to prepare her for heaven. And I have quite a full confidence that he did that. How are we saved? By faith plus works? No. <laughs> but a genuine faith does work. A genuine faith receives his righteousness and in receiving it, we receive it not just mentally and recognize something written up there. No, no. He gives us himself. It's himself his own record, his own life that is given to us as though it was something we had lived out when we have not and could not. But when he is received by us by faith, that faith opens our hearts to the Holy Spirit to perform his work and he does in us not without our will, but he does it in us through our own wills by which we invite him to begin with. And he has promised. And now let me tell you something. You do not have to worry about salvation. He has already guaranteed it. If you accept him and you continue to receive him, you are certain of salvation. If you don't, have this, uh, uh, if, even if you accepted him as being divine and all the rest, but did not have this confidence. 
you, you would not be open as he wants you to for him to be able to do all the things for you that he is prepared to do. What is the Minneapolis message? The Minneapolis message has a negative side as well as a positive side and without the negative side, the positive side does not function. And the negative side is that we give up on ourselves. We realize there is no hope within ourselves. No matter how intense our efforts, we cannot purify ourselves. The Bible says in the Old Testament, can a, an Ethiopian change his skin? Leopard his spots? No, they're, they're, that's what they are by nature. What are we by nature? Corrupt, selfish. And by the way, we're not talking about corruption. I'm not talking about killing people. I'm not talking about committing adultery. It might involve all of those things. But what I'm talking about primarily is selfishness. That is the primary corruption that causes all other corruptions. Ellen White says that under the heading of selfishness came every other sin. And that's why humility is so important because it is the only way in which we can receive love, which is the antidote to selfishness. Only through humility can we receive that love that purifies the soul and prepares us for ministry here and for a place in the kingdom hereafter. So what are the Minneapolis principles? We'll, we'll have plenty of time for Minneapolis because that's a very important thing. God gave us the key to preparation for the end in the Minneapolis message. And what is it? Christ our righteousness. Now I've said it a little different way this time. Before I said Christ in you, put those two together because they're both vital. Christ our righteousness is Christ in you our righteousness. Is his righteousness today as pure as it was? Yes. If he is in you, then he will bring with him into your life those principles that he worked out in his own life when he was here. And that's how simple, and maybe you say, well, that didn't quite so simple as to me, but to me that's a very simple thing. Christ's life stands in place of mine if... I receive him and claim his righteousness instead of... Now, by the way, I do need to seek to be pure and holy and so forth, but I cannot be saved by the things that I do. And I cannot be good enough to be saved, but he is good enough. And I can, right now, when the Pentecostals come to you and say, are you saved? Well, they have one idea of salvation. You may have a different one. But yes, if you've received Christ, you have life. That's, John tells us that in chapter uh, 1 John 5. says, he that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son of God has not life. So are you da daily receiving Christ in your life? If you are, you're saved. He is Actually, in several places, he has guaranteed your salvation. Philippians 1, 6, Paul says, being confident of this very thing. Now, it's something pretty important, or he wouldn't begin that way. He tells us, listen up. I want to talk to you about something that's more important than anything else. This very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We have absolute assurance. And there are other verses I would like to take time, but our time is going. Christ has guaranteed your salvation. Now, if you do not believe that, then you have not received the Minneapolis message. No matter how theologically capable you are of arguing certain points, if you have received Christ Jesus and believe that he will prepare you, then you have received the Minneapolis message. And if you haven't, you still don't know what the message is. You may be able to talk words that sound like you know. It may be the same words that somebody else who does know would say. But unless you have the experience of it, and this was the thing that stood 
uh, uh, so in such stark contrast between Ellen White's response to jo Jones and Wagner and the leadership. And that is that Ellen White did not see the Minneapolis message as a theology. She was not interested in the theolo theology of it. When they were debating over the law in Galatians, she said, I don't know which law, but my soul would say amen. And either one, if it were evident that this was, was true. Why was she not concerned about the theology of it? Because she had the reality of it. And she knew what the reality was. How we say it may be different. But how we experience it, there might be an individual experience that markedly different than somebody else, but it's still the same ingredients that save us. And that is the ingredient of Christ's blood, his righteousness. Ellen White loved to quote uh, statements like this, Psalms 85.10, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. She's talking about the cross. Mercy and truth. Have you committed any sins? Yeah, well, that's true. So that's the truth about you. Okay. What about mercy. See, when Christ deals with us on the basis of truth, the question of mercy comes up. It does, is he truly merciful? Yes. He places himself in your place. He does not demand that you do certain perform, you know, perform things or give money to the church. He requires that you believe that he is your righteousness. And then she says, and then the psalmist says, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. When a person has committed unrighteousness, does he have peace? Well, here it says righteousness and peace, but that's for the perfect person, isn't it? What if you have not always been righteous? And by the way, it doesn't matter what you do now or in the future, you're still a sinner. You're still uh, uh, condemned by judgment. But now you come to the king of the universe and there is an adv adversary there, Satan, who knows every sin you've ever committed and those you don't, don't, you don't know anything about because they have to do with motives, sinful motives that you didn't recognize. He has records of that. Now, how is righteousness and peace in your experience going to be put together? Through the cross. He exchanged positions with you on the cross. When he was crucified, he was crucified for your sins, for my sins. So that you could have his righteousness. This is the simple Minneapolis message. I'm so sorry that we've confused people so often during the years, but sooner or later, and must be sooner, soon, we must receive. Now, I see that I will not get through the slides again this time, but let me just say a few things about what, uh, what I will not be able to do. There is... Ellen White speaks of a straight testimony. That straight testimony must be given. I believe I'm giving it now. But that straight testimony is not focused upon any sin. Whether adultery or, or witchcraft or any sin. What is it focused on? Very simple. The straight testimony is given in Revelation uh, 3, verses 14 and onward, where he says, I know who you are. I know all about you. And first of all, he identifies himself as a creator and so forth. And he says, you're lukewarm. You're neither cold or hot. I wish you were either cold, so you'd want to get warm, or hot. So I could use you. 
But as it is, you're in a very pitiable state. You're self-righteous. You're comfortable with your own righteousness. And I'm interpreting. And then he says, I wish you were either cold or hot. Then he says, you think you're rich. He's talking to people who are self-deceived. You think you're rich. Increase with goods and have need of nothing. You don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now he says, I, I'm knocking at your door. If you listen to me, if you'll take my straight testimony, this is the straight testimony. I will come in to you. I will fellowship with you. Food is a symbol of fellowship. We'll eat together. And it's a, food, a symbol of friendly fellowship, of, of, of where our hearts are drawn to each other. Now he says, I have rebuked you, but it's because I love you. And then he explains to us, those who have overcome will be saved. If you overcome, as I have also overcome and sat down in my father's, uh, in his throne, you'll be able to sit in my throne. And by the way, he's not talking about the eternal throne of the universe. He's talking about the throne that Adam gave up, which he had bought back. He will be the king of this earth as well as the king of the universe. He said, you will sit with me in my throne. And I see... It's time for us to close. Uh, you will have some slides in your materials that we haven't had a chance to cover, but I think they're all quite clear, and I hope that you will take time to meditate upon them. Young people, I want to say as I close that the Minneapolis message was the message God gave to the church intending to finish the work then. We resisted it. There's a battle over, did we actually reject it? Well, there's no formal vote, so we must not have rejected it. But the rejection of the Holy Spirit is not a formal vote. It's a refusal to accept. We did reject. And maybe we want to say it in a little friendlier way, say we didn't accept it. <laughs> But the Holy Spirit was there, eagerly waiting to be received and to carry out all that the Minneapolis message portrayed. We're still here. We did not accept it. To accept it is a very personal thing, but it's also corporate. Because at that alone will unite us. As we accept it individually, we automatically come together. The message of Minneapolis has greater power to unite us than anything else. Shall we bow our heads? Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving your life for us. Help us to understand what Minneapolis means. And we pray that you will help us to be united in our relationship to you re related to each other. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Thank you. Oh my. You're still here. You don't have to stay, but I have to tell you. Here, right here, 1882 to 1885. I'll just tell you this. The book Early Writings which we will be studying one little topic from it, page 74 and 5, because it became a hot battle, and we will discuss that battle. That was written in 1882. Oh, I'll be saying these things again later. But also, Testimony, Volume 5. I think it's about the thickest one of all. It's made up of three segments. One, the testimonies that were gathered together in 1882. 
One they were, and the second one, 85, and the third one, 89. Two of them before 1888, but one of them at the very beginning of Wagner's ministry. The other one in the middle of the conflict. Two of the main sections were written by Ellen White, and those sections, in them you will find the Minneapolis message clearly. Wagner was sitting listening to Ellen White's sermon when he had a vision of Christ crucified. Now you know what she loved to talk about was Christ crucified. And that was the beginning of his special ministry. And that was also at the point in which the first third of volume five was published. And the second third was in 85. I, I, hopefully I'll have a little more time to share some things with you about that. But it's extremely important to remember that God gave the message to Ellen White long before he gave it to Wagner Jones. But we didn't accept it. When he brought it from Wagner Jones, we didn't accept it. All right, this is the third time. God will, in our day, will either receive it or go out. This is the message, the final message for the world to be given by the life of the church, not by just the words of the church. Thank you.